Now, a couple of the a couple of other aerospace connections that we looked at, and well, one, one more detail. We also looked at uh, the possible connections between the Manson family and American Nazis. A man named Red Worthen, and uh, so forth, was something that we looked at. Manson, now a big hero in the Nazi movement, of course. Two key witnesses, Sharon Tate. Well, Sharon Tate, and perhaps Roman Polanski, had he been there, would have been removed. Uh, via the Manson family's depredations. Again, it seems sort of complicated and maybe a little smug or glib under the circumstances, but we detailed all of that in our last Aryan Nations. All of this now is by way of getting to our aerospace connections here. That was the thing that we left off with in our last Aryan Nations broadcast. In addition to the Lockheed Burbank and aerospace connections around the Robert Kennedy assassination that I just detailed for you, the uh, we wound up looking at a man named William Pierce. William Pierce is the author of the Turner Diaries. That is uh, sort of the Bible of the Aryan Nation's neo-Nazi network, and it's sort of a blueprint for their planned takeover of the country and extermination of their racial and political enemies. And it's worth noting that uh, William Pierce, and we're going to reread the article that we read last time, William Pierce was not only an engineer with Pratt & Whitney, a major aerospace contractor, but also had a doctorate in physics. Okay, Also, for our purposes, very closely affiliated with George Lincoln Rockwell's American Nazi Party. Again, returning to an article that we read last time. This article is from the Sunday Portland Oregonian from December 30th of 1984. Research credit for this for May 2 goes to Mae Brussel, whose World Watches series is aired on this program. It's headlined, Former OSU Professor's Novel Considered Bible for Neo-Nazi Terrorists. It's by John Snell of the Oregonian staff. The article reads, A group of neo-Nazi terrorists accused of committing a series of violent crimes throughout the West, ostensibly to preserve the purity of the white race, has used as its blueprint a novel written by a former professor at Oregon State University. The professor, William Luther Pierce, quit the university in 1965 and became a right-hand man, right man of the founder of the American Nazi Party, George Lincoln Rockwell. Today, he is the leader of an East Coast neo-Nazi group, the National Alliance. Pierce's book, The Turner Diaries, has been described by the FBI as a Bible of hatred that details an armed takeover of the United States, including mass executions of blacks and Jews, as well as women who have defiled their race, unquote, by taking black lovers. In the novel, protagonist Earl, protagonist Earl Turner and his followers in the organization use bank robberies, armored car heists, and counterfeiting, among other methods, to foot the bill for the organization's successful effort to take over the country and install a racially pure white society. An FBI informant who infiltrated the white American bastion, the neo-Nazi organization involved in the shootout with FBI agents on Whidbey Island, Washington, earlier this month, said the Turner Diaries was the Bible for the group. Skipping down into the article... Pierce quit his job as an assistant professor of physics at Oregon State University in 1965 and later became editor of National Socialist World, a new magazine published by the American Nazi Party and written to appeal to academics, intellectuals, and professionals. Pierce now heads the National Alliance, a neo-Nazi organization based in Arlington, Virginia, the original home of the American Nazi Party. He refuses to answer any calls from members of the news media, his secretary said. In the Turner Diaries, Pierce wrote that the American media were controlled by Jews and included reporters on his hate list for extermination along with blacks, Jews, Asians, Chicanos, intellectuals, government employees, anyone who was not white, or anyone who had married someone who was not white. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, Pierce received his master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Colorado. Records show he worked as an assistant professor of physics at the Corvallis campus for three years from September of 1962 to June of 1965. He earned a salary of about $8,000 for the nine-month school year, and in addition to doing basic research, directed a $35,000 U.S. Air Force science grant to do research in semiconductors. While at OSU, the then 32-year-old scientist and father of two joined the John Birch Society and supported the 1964 candidacy of Republican presidential nominee Barry Goldwater. He registered as a member of the Republican Party while living in Oregon. In a 1966 interview, Pierce said his interest in the American Nazi Party had been ignited by the number of interracial marriages on the OSU faculty, which he said profoundly disturbed him. He eventually resigned his membership in the John Birch Society, he said. Pierce refused to tell the university officials where he was going when he quit his job at OSU, but revealed at a going-away party later that he was taking a research job at Pratt & Whitney Company in North Haven, Connecticut. American Nazi Party founder George Lincoln Rockwell later enticed Pierce to quit his $29,000 a year job at Pratt & Whitney to take the unpaid post as editor of the National Socialist World. This is worth noting here is that William Luther Pierce quits a $29,000 a year job, and that was a lot of money in the late 60s, 
to uh, go to an ostensibly unpaid job editing George Lincoln Rockwell's National Socialist World. Either a very, very dedicated man willing to embrace, embrace poverty for the cause, or perhaps he became uh, a payroll, of, uh, he was placed on somebody's payroll. Certainly, uh, that's a lot of money to give up for ideology. Continuing. Rockwell, the party commander and Pierce's mentor, was murdered by another follower in 1967, and the Nazi movement began to splinter. Pierce became the information officer for the National Socialist White People's Party, a Nazi group headed by white supremacist Matt Cole, or Kale, K-O-E-H-L, and one of the stronger Nazi groups to emerge after Rockwell's death. So again, reviewing this here, uh, the aerospace connections are one of the things that we've looked at uh, at great length with, with regard to the Aryan nations, the groups around Lockheed Burbank and the Robert Kennedy assassination. We took a look at a Boeing engineer named Robert Murky, who was testified up at the uh, order trial up north. That's a splinter group of the Aryan nations. And again, the Bible for the Aryan nations, the Turner Diaries, written by a man who not only has a doctoral degree in physics, a former research engineer with Pratt & Whitney, a major aerospace contractor and uh, member of United Technologies, which we'll talk, touch back on. It's worth noting also that uh, William Pierce got his start in Nazi activities as one of the protégés and allies of George Lincoln Rockwell. Another uh, George Lincoln Rockwell protégé and ally is discussed here in a footnote in Power on the Right by William Turner. The man in question that they're starting out about talking about is Roy Frankhauser. Um, and the other name will come up in the article. It says, Frankhauser was in the news when, on October 31st, 1965, one Daniel Burroughs, B-U-R-R-O-S, committed suicide in Frankhauser's reading, reading home. Excuse me. Brilliant and psychotic, Burroughs had alternately belonged to the American Nazi Party, the National Renaissance Party, the American Racial Fascist Party, and the KKK. He was on the staff of George Lincoln Rockwell's magazine, The Stormtrooper, resigning in 1962 to edit Kill, which was, quote, dedicated to the annihilation of the enemies of the white people, unquote. Interestingly, too, his name and address, as well as Rockwell's, were in the notebook of accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. Burroughs shot himself when the New York Times printed evidence that he was part Jewish. Um, now, a couple of things to mention real quickly. Again, do note, uh, because of all of our other discussions of uh, these connections, George Lincoln Rockwell's and Daniel Burroughs' addresses, uh, both being in Lee Harvey Oswald's, um, again, a, a supposed leftist, Lee Harvey Oswald's notebook. Um, notice again the fact that Burroughs, uh, as happens to so many other people involved directly or peripherally in the John F. Kennedy assassination and investigation into same, uh, died under strange circumstances. In this case, shot, uh, and I think that Frankhauser was the only witness. I, th I don't even know if Frankhauser witnessed it, but I know he was in the house. Um, Frankhauser himself, of course, a right-wing uh, paramilitary, uh, whatever you want to call it, a Nazi KKK guy. Um, and uh, Burroughs, again, shot himself. Uh, and yet another person who might have something to say with who Lee Harvey Oswald was and who he was being paid by and who his connections were uh, died under strange circumstances. And how an avowed leftist would get the American Nazi Party Fuhrer's personal uh, address and phone number in his address book. Not the usual sort of uh, activity for someone that... Uh, of the type that Oswald was supposed to be. By the way, you're listening to KFJC Los Santos Hills and more about the suicide of Daniel Burroughs or the alleged suicide of Daniel Burroughs. This information comes from a book called The Clan. The Clan was authored by Patsy Sims and the book was published in softcover by Scarborough Books, copyright 1978. And of the alleged suicide of Daniel Burroughs, Patsy Sims writes as follows in The Clan. What about the man who is, she's uh, talking here with a man named Dale Roosh, or uh, Roosh, R-E-U-S-C-H. He's a West, Germ uh, West uh, Virginia uh, Ku Klux Klan leader. And Sims asks him, what about the man who was Grand Dragon in New York and killed himself after the story that he was a Jew ran in the New York Times? Did you know him, I asked? Burroughs? No, Roosh shook his head. All I knew was he committed suicide. Three bullet holes. Bad case of suicide. That's what they said, though. You think somebody else killed him? Roosh shrugged. Don't know, but the state ruled suicide. He tried to kill himself once and didn't succeed, and he pulled the trigger again. He was killed at Roy Frankhauser's house, the former Grand Dragon of Pennsylvania. And uh, Roy Frankhauser is an interesting person and also a uh, man with very interesting connections, as Nip's about to tell you. Indeed. We're going to read another segment here from Pat Patsy Sims' book, The Clan, talking about Roy Frankhauser. 
Um, they're talking about, uh, this is about 1974 that they're talking about and him getting probation, a suspended sentence on a, uh, for a particular uh, offense. They said his somewhat mysterious spy assignment, okay, which, uh, which hinted of CIA ties, was to infiltrate an alleged Canadian-based Black September plot to kidnap and or kill some American Zionist leaders. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer, that mission was approved by the National Security Council, the White House, and ATF, that's Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, John Caulfield, who later figured in the Watergate scandal when he tried to persuade burglar James P. McCord to remain silent in return for White House clemency. Frank Hauser's turbulent life also has witnessed, has also has included testifying, or taking the fifth, before the House on American Activities Committee and witnessing the suicide in his reading apartment of New York Dragon Daniel Burroughs. Okay, so going back again, he was involved in um, a spy assignment which was supposedly to infiltrate uh, a Canadian-based uh, plot by the Black September Group. Of course, the Black Sept September Group is the, the uh, Palestinian uh, extreme nationalist terrorist group to kidnap, slash, or kill uh, some American Zionist leaders. So first of all, you have Roy Frankhauser, uh, a bigwig in the in the Klan, and uh, with the Minutemen, et cetera, et cetera, saving a bunch of American Zionists. Okay, first off, that's what they want you to believe. Second of all, they want you to believe that they had to infiltrate him into a Canadian-based Black September plot, um, when in fact, as we've talked about in the past, the... Uh, the CIA seems to have enough connections to Black September to be able to handle it without having to infiltrate uh, if they wanted to at least know what was going on, let alone control what was going on. Uh, as we mentioned in previous broadcasts, they seem to have enough connections they could do it themselves without have to, having to uh, infiltrate an American, uh, an American KKK member into the group. So, but again, this is besides the supposed suicide of Daniel Burroughs, a potential Robert, uh, John F. Kennedy assassination trial conspiracy witness. Besides witnessing that quote-unquote suicide, um, he also has been involved with a CIA plot on behalf of, among other people, uh, John Caulfield, a prime mover in the Watergate cover-up. Um, so, an interesting man, and again, you see the kind of interesting connections that seem to develop uh, just as we will talk about later in this show between people like John Singlob and the World Anti-Communist League and the Reagan administration. In this case, the KKK, uh, a supposed Black September group, and uh, the Nixon administration. It's worth noting that Roy Frankhauser, in addition to uh, quite possibly having functioned as a government agent in this context, and specifically uh, with the Black September, a group that we've looked at on, in One Step Beyond in connection with the Olympics massacre in 1972, and in turn another organization with connections to Western intelligence. Roy Frankhauser has still apparently been uh, rubbing elbows with other Klansmen and members of the Aryan Nations. Specifically, at an Aryan Nations meeting, or a, a meeting of right-wing political leaders, far right-wing political leaders, to lend support to Louis Farrakhan, Roy Frankhauser was front and center, along with a lot of people from the Aryan Nations. Information about that appeared in the New York Times of October 12th of 1985. This is a story by Wayne King of the New York Times. It's headlined, White Supremacists Voice Support of Farrakhan. State line Houston, leaders of neo-Nazi and other white supremacist groups met in a gesture of solidarity against Jews last weekend and talked of an accommodation with Louis Farrakhan, leader of a black Muslim group which has been accused, who has been accused of anti-Semitism. The meeting of 200 leaders and their supporters was held at the Michigan farm of Robert Miles, a former Ku Klux Klan leader. According to people who attended the meeting, several speakers talked favorably about Mr. Farrakhan. Skipping down in the article, according to Mr. Miles, reached by telephone at his farm in Cohotac, Michigan, where the meeting was held, those attending included Dr. Edward Fields, director of the National States Rights Party, a racist group in Birmingham, Alabama, and Richard Gernt Butler, the 65-year-old head of Aryan Nations. The Federal Bureau of, of Investigation says Aryan Nations is the parent of another group, the Order, 10 of whose members are on trial in Seattle on charges including arson, armed robbery, and murder. Also present, according to Mr. Miles, were Don Black, remember that, it's a name we're coming back to, were, were Don Black, a national Ku Klux Klan leader from Alabama who served a prison term for a plot to take over and transform the small Caribbean island of Dominica into a racist state, Roy Frankhauser, identified by the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith as a former Klan leader from Pennsylvania. So, 
Freud Roy Frankhauser still moving in the Aryan Nation circles. Uh, we see him along with Richard Butler, head of the Aryan Nations, and another KKK leader named Don Black. So, uh, again, Frankhauser is still moving in these, these same circles. And, uh, again, the thing that we're asking people to consider is the Aryan Nations as basically an intelligence front, as an underground extension of the military. And remember the name Don Black, because we're going to be coming back to him and his abortive Dominica invasion after our break. That's right. And uh, we are going to be taking that short break for about five minutes before putting on uh, some tapes and explaining some things to you, and we will, of course, preface those tapes. Queens area in particular have been the focus of a good deal of uh, David Duke's white supremacist activity over the years. Now, the first thing we're going to look at uh, in connection with Duke today is his activities while a student at Louisiana State University. While at LSU, Duke apparently devoted a good deal of his uh, extracurricular time to promoting white supremacy, and one of the things that he did in this regard was to found an organization called the White Youth Alliance. Its uh, name pretty much implies what it is. It's uh, a young uh, white supremacist, young fascist organization, and uh, this organization was founded by Duke, as I said, while he was a student, and one of the things that's interesting is his White Youth Alliance is apparently very closely intertwined in a number of ways with an organization called the National Socialist White People's Party. Now, that uh, is an American Nazi party which grew out of American Nazi party Fuhrer George Lincoln Rockwell's organization. Now, in the past, uh, specifically last week, we uh, took a look at the connections between George Lincoln Rockwell and Lee Harvey Oswald and also a uh, New York Klan leader named Daniel Burroughs. And uh, we also took a look at uh, the fact that not only was George Lincoln Rockwell then assassinated, but uh, Daniel Burroughs uh, committed suicide with three bullets. Now, after Rockwell's assassination, his organization metamorphosed into the National Socialist White People's Party. And in 1970, the National Socialist Bulletin, the publication, the newsletter of the, National, of the NSWPP, basically focused quite heavily on David Duke's activities, talking about him as a Nazi leader at LSU or in Louisiana. And interestingly enough, uh, in some of his publications done in connection with, some of his publishing done in connection with the White Youth Alliance, David Duke quoted verbatim from the NSWPP publication. And a still more interesting connection between the two organizations, that is the NSWPP and David Duke's White Youth Alliance, concerns the fact that uh, David Duke gave the mailing address for one of his White Youth Alliance programs as the, well, basically an Arlington, Virginia mailing address, which was also the mailing address of the NSWPP, the National Socialist White People's Party. So, uh, apparently, there uh, is some fairly close but under or was some fairly close but a poorly defined link between duke and the nswpp the organization that grew out of rockwell's nazi party now for all of our information on duke in this program we're going to be relying on a book that we've dealt with in the past uh, and relied on very heavily in uh, the first two programs uh, in the clan series that book is entitled appropriately enough the clan it was authored by patsy sims last name s-i-m as in mary s and was published in softcover by Scarborough Books. It was copyrighted in 1978, and uh, Patsy Sims, the author, is a former reporter not only with the San Francisco Chronicle and, and the New Orleans States Item, but uh, she also wrote with the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, and uh, we quoted from the, the Inquirer last week. So uh, Sims, a veteran and uh, well-traveled reporter, and her book, The Clan, is one of the best, if not the best, books uh, on this subject, in my opinion. At any rate, uh, of David Duke and his connections with, the, well, that is to say, the connections between his white youth alliance and the National Socialist White People's Party, Patsy, Cl Patsy Sims writes as follows. The National Socialist Bulletin, official publication of the National Socialist White People's Party and edited for a time by Duke Lieutenant Jim Warner, took note of Duke's activities in Louisiana. One item in the August 1st, 1970 issue referred to, quote, local national socialists led by Dave Duke, a student at Louisiana State University. That fall, a special edition of the White Youth Alliance's Racialist included a white power program, unquote, in which Duke, under his own byline, copied verbatim passages from the already published Goals and Objectives of the NSWPP. The back page carried a boxed coupon captioned, 
Membership application for the White Student Alliance, 2507 North Franklin Road, Arlington, Virginia, 22201. The address of the National Socialist White People's Party. So again, when uh, Duke gave a mailing address for his White Youth Alliance, it was the same as that for the American Nazi Party, the NSWPP. Now, interestingly enough, uh, also while at uh, Louisiana State, David Duke apparently took on, or uh, according to his own his own statement, he served a hitch with the Agency for International Development. And specifically, what he did for AID was to teach English to Laotian soldiers over uh, in Vientiane, the capital of Laos. Now, uh, Patsy Sims describes David Duke's alleged activities on behalf of uh, AID as follows. The university degree and his physical appearance were not all that set him apart from the rough-hewn Knight Rider image usually associated with the infamous KKK initials. Articulate, charming, and sexy, Duke was boyishly sophisticated, his vocabulary encompassing gosh and golly and vis-a-vis, -vis. his accent worldly. The son of an engineer, Duke was born in Tulsa, attended kindergarten in The Hague, and a private military school in Georgia, and had lived in sundry other places before his parents moved to New Orleans in the early 60s. He interrupted his college studies, he said, to spend part of 1971 in Vientiane teaching English to Laotian army officers in what he described as, quote, a special government program, unquote, conducted by the State Department's Agency for International Development. Now, interestingly enough, the uh, CIA has often used AID, the Agency for International Development, as a front. And uh, interestingly enough, the CIA has admitted using AID as a front in Laos, where Duke maintains he was. Now, uh, one of the most interesting things about David Duke concerns the fact that he apparently has elicited suspicions on, in a great many quarters that he is, in fact, an agent for the government, and specifically a CIA agent. Now, uh... Patsy Sims discusses Duke's apparent or alleged activities on behalf of the government in uh, the in the in, in her book The Clan. Now, the first section that we're going to deal with of her discussion of Duke's possible activities as an agent concerns uh, her interview with a detective who had apparently been monitoring the Clan for two years and the various other right-wing groups for a total of six. Now, he maintains that David Duke, or he believes that David Duke is CIA. He cites his activity teaching in Laos on behalf of AID, the fact that his father served with the State Department, which we're going to talk about in a second, and uh, he thinks that uh, his anti-Jewish attitudes would be desirable uh, from a certain standpoint, uh, uh, that would be that the State Department would regard them as desirable because that could uh, be useful in promoting relations with uh, certain anti-Zionist uh, Arab factions, okay? So uh, that's one reason that uh, this particular detective felt that uh, the CIA might want a Klan leader. That is to say, one of, the, one of their agents to become a Klan leader. Now, Patsy Sims described this in the Klan as follows. But I pondered even more the possibility that he was an agent for somebody. At his Baton Rouge home, he had scoffed when I confronted him with insinuations made by Shelton and other clan leaders. That goes back to some sort of weird thought process where they say, he's getting on national television and he's hitting him so hard and so forth, he can't really be doing this. He can't be getting away with this. He must be working for the enemy. Because they themselves have been failures in their own approach, unquote. Earlier in my travels, a detective who had monitored right-wing groups for six years, the last two assigned exclusively to the clan, had offered his own theories. There are two ways to look at David Duke. Either he has been working for somebody for an awfully long time, or he's making money. Look at David as being CIA. He taught in Laos. His father is with the State Department. David being associated with right-wing groups, he's anti-Jewish. Any anti-Jewish propaganda would be supported by an Arab faction, so consequently, an Arab faction may want to talk to David in order to keep the fires burning on the Jews. It's hypothetical, but he travels a lot more than what we think his expenses would allow him to. And he's just been around so long. Of course, uh, looking for people who apparently have no <clears throat> no apparent means of funding is one, uh, one thing one looks for in examining for a possible intelligence agent. And the fact that uh, apparently uh, Duke did a lot more traveling than he appeared to be able to afford was one of the things that elicited this particular detective's suspicion. 
Now, another thing that this uh, detective found very interesting was the fact that David Duke was the one Klan leader that uh, the government never asked for information on. And this is covered by Patsy Sims in the Klan as follows. Also, the detective continued, Another very, very good reason that makes me think David is working for somebody is that none of the federal agencies have ever come to us for information on him. Everybody else they do, but not for him. They don't ask us for Klan information. On the other hand, 95% of the FBI information on the left comes from local law enforcement. This is only theory, he cautioned, but... Well, next, uh, Patsy Sims describes her own reasons for suspecting David Duke as an agent. First of all, the fact that uh, he always seemed to turn up at all of the hot spots uh, where possible uh, racial confrontations could occur. Uh, the fact that he apparently got around a great deal, apparently one time was in Washington ten times in the space of a single year. Also, he at one point showed Patsy Sims a, a debugging device that, according to Duke, had been given to him by a government friend. He also at one point... Uh, forged a, an alleged attack manual instructing blacks on how to kill white people under the pen name of Mohammed X, he said, in order to keep track of uh, enemies of the white race. And uh, one of the most interesting uh, details that Patsy Sims cites in uh, maintaining that David Duke may have been a, a uh, government agent is the fact that uh, when he went to England, uh, London, the British Customs attempted to bar David Duke from entering the country. He got in anyway, evading British Customs, and then continued to evade Scotland Yard, who were trying to arrest and deport him. So, uh, apparently, David Duke on his own was able to, to uh, evade not only British Customs, but also Scotland Yard, which is uh, no mean feat for a private citizen, particularly in a foreign country. Now, of uh, Patsy Sims' reason for suspecting Duke as an agent, she writes as follows. I had my own reasons for suspecting Duke's role as an agent. He popped up everywhere, in places the government would want someone on the inside. Boston and Louisville during the busing demonstrations, the Marine Corps infiltrations, taking on the illegal trafficking of aliens at the Mexican border, meeting nationally and internationally with other right-wingers. He was in the Washington area at least ten times in the course of a year. Once, when I met him at his motel, he showed me what looked like a small block of wood, explaining that it was a bug detector a government friend, unquote, had given him, and walked around the room to test it. I speculated the agent role could possibly explain an attack, unquote, manual on how to kill white people that he surreptitiously wrote under the pseudonym of Mohammed X, in order, he insisted, when confronted by the New York Times in early 1978, to compile a list of blacks involved in racist activities against white people. Unquote. It could also explain how he managed to slip past London Customs in March of 1978 after the British government had banned entry by him and other Klan leaders and then play hide-and-seek with Scotland Yard when it attempted to find and deport him. Again, no mean feat for a private citizen. <clears throat> now, when uh, Patsy Sims attempted to run down uh, from the government information on Duke's possible role as a, uh, uh, a government agent, and specifically his work for AID, or alleged work for AID, she was unable to uh, positively verify that Duke was a government agent. <clears throat> she uh, did, however, get sort of uh, what I guess one could describe as a government, as, as a standard runaround. She describes that as follows. Obtaining information on him, that is to say Duke, obtaining information on him from the government proved impossible. Duke repeatedly claimed he could remember neither the name of the teaching program in Laos nor of his supervisor and suggested I call the State Department or its Agency for International Development or its Agency for International Development. For days, my calls were transferred from department to department in both the State Department and the USAID. No one could remember such a program. People who had been in Vientiane in 1971, the time Duke supposedly taught there, could not recollect anyone by his name or description. I then tried the Pentagon and various branches of the military and again came up with nothing. When Hotting Carter III was named Deputy Press Secretary for the State Department, I renewed my efforts, hopeful another journalist could help. Carter returned my initial call within 15 minutes, even though he had been in his job less than two weeks. He sounded anxious to help and asked me to put my request in writing. A year later, the letter, written February 3rd, 1977, had not been answered, nor were subsequent phone calls to Carter. So again, she was unable to get any, anything positive about David Duke's uh, work for the U.S. government.
worth noting here that uh, one of the detectives' reasons for suspecting Duke's possible uh, role as a, what he believed, a CIA agent concerned the fact that his father worked for the State Department. His father also served in the military, and uh, Patsy Sims describes her father, uh, David Duke's father, rather, as follows. She visited him at one point. On my way back east, I stopped in Washington to meet Duke's father. Aside from gray hair and a slight Midwestern flavor to his voice, the elder Duke looked and sounded remarkably like the youthful clan leader, especially as the private meeting at Fort Myers at the Fort Myers Officers Club darkened with the day and the father's views surfaced. A graduate of the University of Kansas and a retired colonel in the R in the US Army Reserve, he had been employed as an engineer for twenty five years by Shell Oil Company, and for the past ten by the US State Department, mostly in Southeast Asia overseeing the planning and construction of hospitals and schools for the Vietnamese government. Back in this country less than two years, he had followed his son's careers in letters from home, his son's career in letters from home and the military's stars and stripes. Worth noting here that uh, much of the KKK activity in the military, particularly in the Marine Corps, was carried on be on behalf or by David Duke's Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. So uh, that is undoubtedly how his name appeared in stars and stripes here. Now, it's worth noting here that uh, David Duke's father's views on race apparently were not uh, all that far from his son's. And uh, Patsy Sims, in this uh, very same conversation with her father that she refers to, with the Duke's father, rather, that she refers to, gives us a little insight into uh, just uh, how David Duke's father sees the issue of uh, race. In the clan, she writes as follows. The father described his relationship with his son as close. They often talked by phone, usually about the family or general politics. Never about the clan, he insisted. Nevertheless, he took stock both of his son's accomplishments and the need for his work. A good old school teacher one time said, The white Americans and the, and the Europeans have over 5,000 years of cultural development, and these people are three and four generations out of being completely heathen savages. How can we expect them to compete and come in and develop and be everything we are, to live in our society and be together in our society. Or he's got a point, right or fair. The father shrugged. I'm not anti-black. I'm just trying to talk facts. Unquote. I'd like to uh, wind things up here uh, with uh, a description of a David Duke uh, parade and cross-lighting here. At least uh, the parade. This uh, preceded a cross-lighting, a cross-burning, I should say. And uh, keep in mind the possibility that David Duke is a government agent uh, as you listen to this description of his organization in action. At first it was quiet, just the rhythmic right-left, right-left of the marcher's footsteps. Then the shouts exploded into the Sunday morning quiet like rounds from a machine gun, slamming back and forth again and again across Decatur Street until the echoes dissolved into a silence as deafening as the shouts. A hoarse male voice led the litany. What do we want? White power. What do we got? White power. White power, white power, one more time, white power. Each round grew louder, more piercing, more frightening, with children and women, even Chloe Duke, slinging their voices into the verbal barrage. Only Dutton and his partners marched, marched stoically, neither chanting nor, like the others, extending their left arms in Nazi-type salutes. The three stared straight ahead, oblivious to the motorcycle police escorts, wide-eyed tourists, and tittering blacks. One small girl, robed like the rest, clung to her father's hand, her face reflecting none of the arrogance of the other marchers. In spite of the humid September heat, the child and the man on crutches kept up as the block, block long parade turned onto Canal Street. That uh, just about winds things up for a fact that uh, pretty much concludes uh, the presentation of material for this program. Summing up very briefly, we began by taking a look at uh, the apparently very close working. A relationship between a, a organization David Duke headed while a student at LSU called the White Youth Alliance and the National Socialist White People's Party, which grew out of George Lincoln Rockwell's American Nazi Party. Following that, we took a, a look at uh, David Duke's statement that he, while at LSU, interrupted his studies to go teach English to Laotian soldiers for the State Department. After that, we took a look at uh, a number of interesting indications that Duke might, in fact, be a government agent. First of all, we took a look at a, at a detective who uh, had been monitoring the KKK for a couple of years. 
And this detective pointed to the fact that the uh, Duke says he worked in Laos, the fact that his father worked for the State Department, uh, the fact that he was anti-Semitic and therefore might be a desirable touch point for certain anti-Semitic Arab interests in this country, uh, and uh, the fact that he apparently did a lot of traveling with no visible means of support. Also, uh, this particular detective thought was very curious. And also the, de the detective cited the fact that... Uh, no other government agencies sought information on Duke, whereas they always went to him and uh, other uh, law enforcement officers for information on other Klan leaders. Now, Patsy Sims uh, also took a l also uh, voiced her suspicions concerning Duke's possible status as an agent, again, pointing to all the traveling he did, the fact that he always would show up in potential racial hotspots, uh, so places where the government would want an insider, the fact that he at one point showed her a bug detector she said had been given him by a government friend, and uh, very curiously, the fact that uh, well, he not only authored an attack manual on whites, uh, apparently ostensibly um, authored by a uh, black militant, but uh, perhaps the single most important indication uh, here of Duke's possible status as a government indication is a government uh, a government agent is the fact that he not only went into London against the will of the authorities, he was able to evade British customs who were trying to prevent him from entering the country. He was also able to successfully evade Scotland Yard while inside Britain, and they were trying to find him and deport him. Uh, not an easy thing to do. After that, we took a look at the fact that David Duke's father not only was a retired military man, but also served uh, with the State Department in Laos, uh, or in uh, Vietnam, building schools and hospitals for the Vietnamese government. He was an engineer, and uh, apparently David Duke's father held views on race very similar to David Duke. And, of course, we wound up with uh, what I think one could accurately describe as a fairly chilling description of a David Duke rally in which uh, the chanters uh, give all the indications of being uh, ready, willing, and able to follow in the footsteps of Adolf Hitler. At any rate, to keep all those things in mind, we'll be back next week with... Uh, the and uh, that particular show, Dave, will not be back next week because that's a hard rain broadcast. And uh, you are going to hear, however, another hard rain broadcast dealing with the same mercurial Mr. Duke. But currently you are live in the studios at KFJC, or actually we are, and you are listening to us live in the studios at KFJC. Uh, again, uh, the summing up was pretty thorough. Um, we want to bear in mind the possibility, as we've been talking about all night tonight, about these connections, about the injection of uh, diehard right-wing uh, racist uh, ideology into the American public sector and into the government and the overlapping of, uh, of uh, clandestine political uh, agencies and, in fact, with right-wing paramilitary groups. David Duke, a possible very good example of that if, as it seems, he is, in fact, himself a government agent of some sort. And, uh, again, the evidence for that as related in the last Hard Rain broadcast. And uh, David Duke has a rather interesting agenda. If David Duke is not currently uh, a government agent, he certainly ought to be, because as we'll find out in the next Hard Rain broadcast that we're going to air in just a moment, he certainly had thought of some things that the Reagan administration thought of and uh, thought of them even before they did. So that's what's coming up. Uh, again, we're going to recite a couple of names that you will want to remember. We were just talking in the last part of the broadcast before we aired that last Hard Rain tape about a David Duke and his involvement with some other Klan people, Roy Frankhauser and Don Black. Don Black's name is going to come up. David Duke's name will come up again. And Roy Frankhauser, you will remember, like David Duke, was... Uh, well, Roy Frankhauser was affiliated with a man named Daniel Burroughs. Daniel Burroughs affiliated with George Lincoln Rockwell, as was David Duke. George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, his name uh, appeared in Lee Harvey Oswald's notebook along with Daniel Burroughs's. Daniel Burroughs then died, supposedly committed suicide in Roy Frankhauser's house. So those connections between Burroughs and Duke, both connected to Rockwell, and the connections between uh, Duke and and Burroughs, I mean, excuse me, Duke and Frankhauser, the man in whose house Burroughs died, and Don Black will be coming up. You might want to bear those sort of things in mind. And we're going to start talking about uh, Caribbean roulette of a sort. And we're going to be airing on that subject another hard rain. And uh, we all set? Uh, yeah, we're all set. And basically, uh, remember the information which Nip just reviewed and which I reviewed after uh, running that down on the hard rain tape just concluded. In particular, take a look now at... Uh, probable, I think we can say, U.S. intelligence agent David Duke and his role in some paramilitary activities 
Uh, compare these also with what we refer to as the Cuban Fry Corps that was put together by the National Security Establishment to harass Fidel Castro before, during, and after the Bay of Pigs invasion. And compare the this paramilitary milieu that we talked about as the Cuban, discussed as the Cuban Fry Corps with a lot of activities that are going on today. Some we're about to describe and some we'll describe later on in the broadcast. All right, and you are again listening to Radio Free America and we're now airing a short segment from a hard rain broadcast with Dave Emery. My name is Dave Emery, and I'll be your host for the next half hour or so. During the course of that half hour, we're going to be continuing with our ongoing discussion about the Ku Klux Klan, specifically looking at some ominous indications that the Klan may be connected to the U.S. government or elements thereof. Now, in our last broadcast on the subject, we talked about a KKK leader named David Duke, last name D-U-K-E. Duke was formerly the head of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, a Klan organization based in New Orleans. Now, in our broadcast on David Duke, we took a look at some ominous indications that David Duke, in addition to being a Klan leader, may also be a U.S. government agent. And uh, today in our broadcast, we're going to resume with our discussion of David Duke, and specifically, we're going to take a look at his role in an abortive Klan and Nazi plot to take over the Caribbean island of Dominica in 1981. Now... All of our information on this broadcast is going to be coming from a publication which covers the activities of the intelligence community very closely. That publication is called Covert Action Information Bulletin. And specifically, the issue of CAIB, Covert Action Information Bulletin, that we're going to be using is number 16 from March of 1982. Okay, so CAIB number 16, March of 1982. The article that we're going to be using... Uh, Almost, exclu almost exclusively for our broadcast is called Behind the Klan's Caribbean Coup Attempt. And it is the, the article here is the second of a two-part series. That article was authored by Ken Lawrence, last named L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E. -E. Now, in the first part of Lawrence's article here about an attempted, uh, as, I, as I said, an attempted Ku Klux Klan and American and Canadian Nazi attempt to take over the Caribbean nation of Dominica and basically turn it into a national socialist or uh, fascist entity, sort of a, a white supremacist's paradise in the Caribbean. Basically, uh, the first part of Ken Lawrence's discussion here talks with David Duke's role in basically getting the plot going. Now, David Duke was contacted by a mercenary leader named Michael Perdue, last name P-E-R-D-U-E. Perdue was sort of the linchpin of the whole effort in the sense that... Uh, he coordinated most of the hands-on activities of this abortive coup himself. David Duke was one of the people he went to in order to get names that he could contact in order to, that is, that Purdue could contact in order to build up this particular plot. Now, initially, this Klan and Nazi group was plotting with former, former Grenadian Prime Minister Eric Gary, last name G-A-I-R-Y. Now, Gary was deposed in a coup in 1979 by the late Maurice Bishop in his New Jewel movement. And initially, David Duke, Michael Perdue, and the rest of the Klan and Nazi plotters were going to be joining forces with Gary in order to restore Gary to uh, his former position as Prime Minister and Ruler of Grenada. The initial, uh, now eventually, the difference in uh, tactical approaches favored by Michael Perdue and Eric Gary led to the two of them to part ways. And uh, when they disagreed, Michael Perdue took this... Uh, incipient coup attempt and directed it against Dominica instead. Okay, but initially the target was Grenada. And keep in mind, uh, in particular here, or focus on the role of David Duke in help helping to uh, get this whole plan together. Okay? Of the recruitment process by which the Klansmen and the Nazis were grouped together in order to uh, take over initially Grenada and eventually Dominica once the fallout between Purdue and Gary occurred, of this Ken Lawrence writes as follows. This once again from Behind the Klan's Caribbean Coup Attempt from Covert Action Information Bulletin Number 16, March of 1982. Lawrence writes as follows. 